Two and a half years ago, we set out to record Chapter 3 for Wide Only the Wreckage. Little did we know, we'd end up recording a soundtrack for the end of the world. We really have no idea what we're doing. We've never made a documentary before, but we did make sure cameras were rolling the entire time. So uh, take this journey with us, and we love you guys. It felt like we were on top of the world, and then it all crashed and burned so hard. So we dropped Welcome to Seattle, and a lot of people liked it, a lot of, it was well received. And I had kind of called that in the beginning when we first set out to make our first record. I remember saying to Kyle, so we're going to make our gish, which is uh, Dark Futures, and it's going to be uh, so you know, garagey, it's gonna have a lot of heart, but you know, it's not gonna be great. And then we're gonna make our Siamese dream and everybody's gonna love it. And it's just gonna elevate everything. And then all of our lives are gonna have to fall apart so that we can make the comeback record that will be our melancholy and the infinite sadness. Uh, and it's sad how true that became even when I called that about five years ago. Uh, and we bought our own hype. And we decided to ride on that and we fucked our entire lives up. We were trying to wrestle with a lot of things at the same time. You know, we had to say goodbye to brothers. We had people very close to us who aren't here anymore. And we went through a lot of shit. So coming into this record, we had learned so many lessons that we needed to show everybody. I, I think we had reached a point where we had watched all of our hopes and dreams burned to the ground, and this is what needed to rise out of the ashes. We wrote and recorded this record like two years ago now, and what started out as a record about mental health and struggles we all face and all of that ended up really changing and becoming, I feel like the record is more about like enduring because, I mean, the world ended and we figured out a way to still create through it and still put out this record. And I think that made a huge difference. Ultimately, this album became something that none of us anticipated with the world being shut down. You know, we were able to not only make it something that we were into, something that we were going to be proud of um, and happy to show off and, and wanting to show off, but also something that you know, maybe helped us get through some of the shit we were dealing with on our own. So when I listen to this record, instead of feeling sad or feeling dark, I feel like it feels like an album about, like, unity and perseverance. Oh yeah. Cool. It sounds, sounds like the meaty killer. fucks. Cool. Like the biggest titties. Alright, let's do it. The biggest, softest titties. They're supple. We all love <laughs> boobies. It's okay. Malcolm coming into this band saved this band. You know, basically we had a uh, we had a makeover. We had a uh, bit of plastic surgery, if you will. I am the f new nose in Wild Only in the Wreckage, and uh, you know what? I think I look just great. <laughs> Big swinging dick. He saved the band. Truth be told, we had reached this crossroads and we knew that for us to survive we had to make some changes 
and we never held auditions. We never even called anybody else. Um, Malcolm was the guy. So I've been trying to order one at a time the uh, Golden Girls Chia Pets. So far I have Blanche. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with Rose next, but it might be Dorothy. You know what? Sophia. It's going to be Sophia. Basically, Malcolm came up. He's like, dude, we need something. Like, if you guys need somebody, I'm here. And I said, you're the first person I want to ask. And luckily for us, he accepted. Well, I joined the band, uh, I think, April of 2019. Malcolm's already sang on our records before Malcolm's been here the entire goddamn time. Malcolm was licking vodka off the floor at the showbox while we played the showbox. Uh, Malcolm's been here every step of the way. It's like he's been here the entire time. So the only way this band continues is with Malcolm. I came in and I was like, listen, I'm going to come in, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to show up, and I'm going to play music. I'm going to be on Broadway! <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm has these knowledges of harmonies and the way certain things fit together that I can't even begin to wrap my head around. It's, it's a collaborative effort in any creative process. Um, wreckage was cool. They didn't really treat me like the new guy, even when I felt like it. It's also so cool when your favorite singer in your home city joins your band. So I get to sing with my favorite vocalist all the time. <laughs> Banana. Banana. <laughs> Do you know how fucking hard it is to be the lead singer of a band where your backing vocalist is a better singer than you? It's really frustrating. Harmonizing with uh, Wyatt really added a new level to the uh, recording process and to the stage show. I think one of the other biggest things was there wasn't an attempt to try to fit in to make his place feel like either a replacement or trying to keep an old thing going. It really was about the band as a whole, what are we bringing as musicians and what are we going to do to get to the next level and create. Yeah. Up there I'm trying to have my moment of glory and all of a sudden this guy on stage right of me is just fucking killing it every goddamn time! You seem beautiful. Oh, you are beautiful. That's... that's true. Okay. Well, that's just silly. You did a day! Don the motherfucking machine gun is amazing. Really possibly the worst band I've ever worked with. Don Gunn is the fifth member of this band, and always has been. Maybe the worst band in the world. Pulling stuff out of you, pulling creativity out of you, that I enjoy, because you can have that conversation with some people and others you can't, he's one of the people you can have that conversation with. And he just, it's ultimately out of a desire to get the best out of you. Don understands what we're gonna do before we do it. Don knew when we recorded our first record, what our second record was going to sound like. He also knew when we recorded our second record what our third record was going to sound like. And I feel like he has done such a good job at bringing it all out of us. You're pushing us to do better and be better. And you're asking us to try new things and be exploratory and try different creative outlets. I don't know. They're going nowhere. Don creates this environment of trust and this circle of comfort for all of us where we're able to be vulnerable and track from our soul and nothing is just mechanical. Uh, everything is authentic. I've tried to move. I've tried to change my number. Doesn't matter. They're back. All the time. Because I'm a whore, I will take their money. But holy shit. This cannot be my swan song! That was money. Fuck yeah! <laughs> Hell yeah! He's also dealt with so much bullshit. Don has had to deal with us throwing parties in the studio. They're all crazy and having random girls throwing up in the studio while we're trying to track vocals. They make me crazy. Don has had to deal with me needing to go to this dark place so I got fully naked to do a screaming section in a song in the middle of his studio and still 
sat tough. I've gone gray in three records. And I'm so proud of him, uh, because we have put him through a world of shit, and he still works with us, and I can't imagine working with a different producer. Don understands this band. I might have to find a new career. They may have driven me out of the thing I love the most. personal favorites on the album. Kind of the sense of uh, chaos and the sort of swirling, you know, war drum beat that's kind of introducing the band. Tribal build and then Malcolm kicks in and then Kyle and I build it and then it just explodes. I've come to bring you life Last chance to put up a fight So rise again The end begins And we will wage the war within I don't know, it's just about finding the strength to rise up and uh, conquer it really take control of it. The song basically decided for itself that it was going to go the record. It's just one of those songs where there's so much power embedded deep inside, and not just from how the song is structured, but from everybody's parts and how they all played it together. It really, it really kind of set the stage as, well, this is the perfect way to open the album. And every time it just kicks you in the fucking face. My name is Darkness and I've come to set you free I'll be the nightmare feeding off your sweetest dreams
but it's so right. Give me shit. Give me shit. I don't want to break his car. Action. Cut. Gotcha. Lindsay. Cut. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> you almost made it. That was fine. Alright, rolling. Action. You <laughs> won! <laughs> Action! Kyle Fall, pick up the envelope, walk away. Nope, nope, that was, that was cheesy. No, it was the head roll in the beginning. Don't do that. Alright, rolling. He's running, action, action, go. Perfect. Action. Turn your head. Three, two, one. That wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm a big kid now. I'm not. I'm a kid wearing dad's guitar. <laughs> I love you, son. <laughs> That's creepy as fuck. Allegory is not necessarily my favorite song on the album because there's a lot of heartache and pain attributed to that, that song. Over the last couple of years, there were some periods of time where I was stuck in some really dark places and making some not so positive decisions. And Kyle, who had come out the other side of a lot of things he was dealing with, was desperately trying to pull his best friend back. Psycho can break! Long story short, I fucked my world to pieces. It was destroyed. I destroyed everything I loved. And I had burned that person out of my life. Like, the, the me. That, that person that I had become. I burned that person out of my life. And I was rebuilding everything from the foundation again. I was also in that same moment realizing that Wyatt, my best friend, had not even reached that point of clarity and I had to do something. It, was, it, it wasn't even necessarily like, I need to help him. It was a, like, it was kind of a plea, basically, like, dude, you gotta, you gotta fix your shit. It's, it's bad. I was absolutely concerned for Wyatt. Um, and so I wrote out these lyrics on, on the bus heading into work at like 6 o'clock in the morning. It just kind of stream of unconsciousness all kind of flowed out. I sent it off to him as just this idea, like, hey, look at these lyrics. I think something could come of this. Allegory. Um, that was actually one of the first batch of songs I think we, we wrote when I joined. You know, Kyle brought this riff that was just very melodic, just this dun, 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 dun. And we all just started jamming on it. And the more we just kind of niddled on it as a band, it actually led itself to uh, really having the strong emotional power behind it that uh, at first I wasn't really expecting. Along with Silver Bullet, it was like this first batch of songs we did. And I remember it was the first song that I wrote a part for. So that was cool. It was, uh, you know, when you show up into a new situation, you're trying to figure it out, trying to read everybody. You know, Are they going to like me? Are they going to like me? Am I going to be okay? And uh, turns out they like me. And I, uh, yeah. I don't know. I like that one, and that's why I always remember that song. It's just because it was the first thing I creatively got to contribute to. And it's the most stripped song on the record. It's nothing's doubled. Guitars aren't doubled. It's very much straight up the band playing in a room. And I think that there's this beautiful, vulnerable sense to it and a lot of beauty to it. <laughs>
we now return to this season of Malcolm vs. Cops. <laughs> songs to play. That's what we needed. Yep. Get Haunted, I am so pumped for. Uh, it's fucking Scooby-Doo chase music, man. There's one important rule that I can share with you that is never, ever, ever, ever let people add tambourines to music. It came together, especially in the chorus, with uh, some really cool harmonies. Uh I can hit the never better. He brought the skeleton. Actually, he brought the complete song. We jammed it out and kind of all got a feel for it. And then once we really all played through it, we kind of went, well, I kind of went, OK, there's actually something here. This is actually kind of cool. It had this just aggressive punk rock kind of swank to it and it had so much attitude uh, and it just sets a really harsh scene. My Chemical Romance meets Nightmare, Nightmare Before Christmas. It's very horror movie-esque. I was impressed though, uh, in all seriousness, when uh, Wyatt and Don were experimenting with introducing the tambourine into Get Haunted. It's my first venture into a song that's like a horror movie. When we had gone to track it, the night before, I had this wild idea where I was like, you know what's missing from this? Pipe organ and uh, tambourine. And Don Gunn picked up the tambourine and uh, rattled it real good for that chorus. And uh, I was able to throw some, some organ on there that sounded really cool. Make us proud. <laughs> Gonna do it. Hit this track for America. It is so much fun. It's almost like putting a Halloween costume on depression uh, and really uh, dressing it up into something where we can celebrate our inner demons. Except for the parts that sucked. I think underneath those parts, we should put in a big like monk choir going, oh, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm we not opposed to any of this. This song is already Scooby Doo as right, fuck. We're gonna, I love we're, it. Let's just go over the top. Let's just have a wonderful time yeah. with it.
Drag me to the funeral pyre Make love to me in the fire Hold me close and never let me go Gandalf's flame Light your way Yep <laughs> That was a thing I don't know what it was I think it was a demon from hell Well it's not gonna get haunted I feel like it's appropriate Oh dude <laughs> Fucking penis! Sound good? Yeah. Alright, cool. Let's try it. Hi! What are we doing today? We're shooting a music video for the song Get Haunted. Documenting all the sexy. Document the sexy. You ready to make a spooky video? Yeah. A spooky video in the middle of a fucking pandemic yeah. on a golf course. Yes. Because what the fuck else do you do in a rock and roll band? Come and join the Hey, how's it going? Terrible. Great. This is right? like that spooky shit that I live for. Oh yeah. Oh, I don't have to do the strap if I do uh, that. I literally got them from Spirit and then customized them with paint. Oh. Okay. my soul, so drag me to the funeral pyre. Make love to oh, me oh, in yeah. the fire. Hold me close and never let me go. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. A little more, a little harder. Uh, <laughs> one more, one more. Okay, there we go. Oh, I'm so sorry. We gotta do it one more time. One more slower shot. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Sorry, just get in position. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's still gonna start the track. You good? Yeah, whatever we're set. All right. We're set. I'm set whenever y'all are. Cool. All right. Everybody and do the next stretches. So why? I'm getting close-ups on you. So cool. I fucked the shit out of me. Oh, of course. Okay. Five. He usually does. Four. Even when you don't have a camera. Three. <laughs> Aww. Two. Aw, boo. One. We now return to this season of Kyle's Big Pink Ding Dong Penis. Now turn out all of the lights so I can see Dark. My little succubus I know that you can't feed off dead hearts Now give me a sign, show me the way To escape the sand that's not out into the day And the neon lights hide the blood stains They call me to stay Trauma Queen Trauma Queen's kind of an interesting one. Yeah, Trauma Queen, I think, is probably, if not my favorite track on the album, probably pretty close. Trauma Queen was a different approach than we had ever really had. It's really just driving the whole time, doesn't really let up. In the rehearsal room, Wyatt had popped up and said, I really got this idea. Just hear me out, it's gonna be crazy. And we already knew it was because Wyatt was talking. I want us to try and do a song that keeps people engaged and interested but only is about three notes. He goes, I want to be able to actually write a song that people can actually gravitate towards and captivates people with just three chords. Okay, well, some of the best songs are written with three chords. So, lay it on us. And that whole song pretty much does revolve around the same three chords. And 
obviously it builds and does some, some extra flary stuff, but uh, I think for the most part it kept this organic simplicity. And he, he played three chords and said, this is my kind of idea for a bass line. And we started kind of like trying to cram too much stuff into it. We started getting like too musician-y about it and not musically about it. I've always enjoyed tunes that have had more of a grip to them. This low end swing and weight, while Kyle and I just kind of complimented the killer rhythm section we're lucky enough to have in this band. And so as soon as we kind of realized, all right, well, we're just fucking up what's already there and just stripped it back down to the super simplistic idea, it actually became a really fucking cool song. And one of my favorite songs to play. I don't know, it's one of the dancier ones we have and I'm, I've grown to hold it in my top five probably. the drink cause we're all gonna die the ship's about to sink and we're all taking the ride and I'll get what I deserve I must confess just another trauma queen at best so pour another drink for we all say goodbye power stance <laughs> solo solo I, I, I know <laughs> I knew the second you went into power stance. I know. Puckered up my anus. Behind the scenes of Trauma Queen with our director Ryan Healy.
We now return to this season of Rob Brennan's cute little green hat. <laughs> <laughs> Silver Bullet was really what kicked it off, and I think there was no question from the beginning that Silver Bullet was going to be the title track. For me, Silver Bullet is probably the most uh, powerful piece on the record. It was the first time I got to hear myself like back with the wreckage. It was the first recording we got back, it was the first music video we shot, so it was the first example I had of, of how dope this record is actually going to be. You kill monsters with silver bullets, and in real life, I feel like you use songs as silver bullets. It ended up being like the perfect metaphor for killing the monster that you would become to resurrect and become the uh, the phoenix that rises from your ashes. I just listen to that song, and it takes me back to being 14 and feeling so misunderstood, and I could put on my favorite song, and I felt like somebody like, you know, Chester Bennington or something understood me. Confessions of sin just to commit. It holds a lot of meaning, and honestly I love that song. It was like probably the coolest pre-chorus like riff on the entire album. A nice introduction to the kind of new style and approach that we just naturally gravitated to toward this third album. We're coming together as a band because I was still the new guy when we were tracking it, and I don't know. It just uh, it really set the tone and got me excited for the, the rest of this album. We didn't allow any cameras in the studio during the first session for this record. Uh, Silver Bullet was the first song we tracked, um, and I had just gotten out of a mental facility and was not in a good spot. And. Luckily, I was surrounded by my three brothers that I love so much, and we were able to create something really incredible. Um, but it's great because it's this snapshot of arguably the most painful period of my entire life. And it is so real and raw, and that screaming at the end of it is so authentic. And from just this guttural, deep place. <laughs> Silver 
So it's really interesting now listening to it from the outside being past all that shit and being able to see how far I as a human being have come from when we tracked that song. So that song will forever mean the absolute world to me. for Silver Bullet was really, really cool. Um, it was the first time we worked with Ryan Healy at Hemp Films. The Silver Bullet music video we shot at this uh, abandoned insane asylum in uh, just outside of Cedro, Quilly, uh, Washington. It was my first uh, single with the band. It was my first video with the band. We were able to create this concept of being outside yourself and fighting with yourself and having that evil twin, that was the perfect message that we needed at that time. Mm -hmm. It was really cool to kind of see myself a little bit uh, figuratively and literally. Uh, obviously with the video I kind of faced myself and the darkness that we all carry and I faced mine. He's a handsome devil. Malcolm's got the best. That wink and the kiss. And yeah, money. That, that wink makes my blood flow increase. In one area specifically. I was absolutely terrified during the video shoot. Mostly because there were going to be two of me in a video instead of one. <laughs> okay, that was on me. That was on me. That was on me. That was on me. Alright, one more. <laughs> that was also on you. This is why I can't have a career in porn. has a different vibe to it than I think anything we've ever done as a band and it's such an ambitious song. It's crunchy, it's heavy, it, but it's gentle and haunting. the match and set fire to the memories that left her haunted and torn. The world gasp, she ran to the skyscraper's edge, said you won't fix me no more. Now the road we walk alone. What a lot of people don't know is uh, I got sick with what ended up being COVID-19 uh, when we were in the studio recording Crooked Angels. Uh, and you can hear it in my voice. Uh, we actually intended on re-recording the vocals for that, but when we listen back to it, I'm having to strain for those notes and it has a really cool, unique characteristic. So in the end, we decided to leave those as it is. And I'm really glad we did because I'm literally sick and throaty and miserable and I've got a fever. And I was just assuming I had like a really awful cold. Uh, yeah, uh, but I'm really thankful for how it came out and I feel like that vibe and that desperation wouldn't have been captured had I been healthy when we recorded that. I'm sorry I gave you all COVID-19. Thanks for the antibodies. Yeah. And all our angels have left us behind In the cold, lonely death of
Oh, the choir vocals. Um, probably better to record those toward the beginning of the night. Uh, we tend to get a little carried away with the high falsetto choir vocals, at least I do. Uh, and then we have to go retrack and uh, do it better. When we got to that big bridge where everything just explodes, I got this rather ambitious idea of what if we do a la la section? And everybody kind of looked at me and was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, what's the most ballsy, risky thing you can do in an album that if it works, it's going to be glorious, and if it fails, it's going to be laughable, and it's a la-la section. In Crooked Angels, did you spot the eunuch choir in the uh, bridge there? Those are real eunuchs. And a real player. Not fake. We don't fuck around here at the wreckage. Real eunuchs. Where are you going to find that? Tracking it and why it's grandiose idea is always to do something like Nightmare Before Christmas. And so we did the Nightmare Before Christmas vocals on it. Crooked Angels is absolutely a tune that uh, I had a lot of fun tracking in the studio. It also marked my first, and maybe only, wreckage vocal debut. <laughs> we'll see how that goes, I suppose. So we were able to do those choir vocals. We even got Rob Brennan uh, singing on those choir vocals, which are actually the first vocals that we've ever tricked Rob Brennan into uh, doing on a wreckage record. Uh, it adds a unique flavor to it. It's something that, uh, again, you won't find on another wreckage tune. And it's, it's what makes that song pop out in my mind. I wanted to tell this story of uh, uh, a young lady because uh, every good story uh, centers around a female. I, I always think every good protagonist is a female, so that's kind of the way we do things. Um, and her dealing with feeling misunderstood and coping with depression and mental health issues. It's a crooked and it's an angel. <laughs> I think one of my favorite things is how we had so much fun with that transition between crooked angels to burn it down. You know, if you fire it up on the album, yeah, that's cool. you have a nice, like, 20 minute uh, set of guitar feedback where you can go for a walk. Uh, you can make a sandwich. You can call somebody you love. Uh, yeah. Good time to get a Hummer, possibly. Every time I close my eyes, all I think about is your cock. Oh. song on the, on the record, I'm going to go out and say it. Burn It Down is definitely one of the most aggressive and purely raw emotional tunes I feel that we've created as a band. For me, it did a great job of kind of capturing this moment in time of uncertainty. Burn It Down is the most angry song on the planet, and I love it for that because it is the most raw unpolished, unapologetic explosion of anger that we've ever put to tape. The whole idea was just to write this heavy thrash, just face-punching song, and still retaining tons of groove. I'm casting shadows o'er the land, fragments of a broken man who burst out into flames rather than just fade away. I'm setting fire to the sea, killing who I used to be. I cut you out of me, and now I finally say. And so 
so when I first started writing it, there was all this anger. Now it's back to the point of, I love that song because it has this, uh, it has a special spot in my heart, mostly because of the lyrics why it wrote for it, because I had to burn the entire world I had built around myself down. Kyle brought in that riff and it just felt so punk rocky and so aggressive. It also has one of Wyatt's best lines, I think, uh, which is, uh, when all is ash, I will begin again. And I think that that is a necessary message for each of us to carry with us on the day to day. I was going through an absolute living hell in my life at the time, you know. All of the, my beautiful castle was crumbling to the ground and all I could do about it was primal scream. Um, so that song was initially intended to be a lot more melodic than it is and uh, I just kinda snapped. So uh, if you've ever wanted to hear me have a mental breakdown on a record, uh, it's that song. And there is so much real raw anger and angst in that that I feel like translates so well. We didn't want to polish it. We didn't want to do a bunch of doubles. We didn't want to um, make you feel anything less for the sake of it feeling overproduced. We just wanted something that was pure, straight emotion authentically, with no one's heart. So That's why I love that song so much, because it just, it hits home, but still stays home. This is a song about getting fucked in jail. Binge is definitely one of my favorite tunes on the album. Oh, the binge. I know that I love the uh, groove, especially when uh, Malcolm and I are really just locked in. There's something really magical about how this bass and drum combination lines up. But it actually is a, pr a pretty grimy tune and grimier in like a, like it's, it's fucking mud. Like you think of, it's, it, it's, it's the closest that we've gotten to writing a grunge tune. And I think that it's our own way with it. It's our own way of approaching a sound that we enjoy. Binge is one of the funnest songs to play. You know, with Wyatt and Kyle working their magic, I'd say this probably has my favorite hook in the entire album. It has such groove to it. There's big old balls swinging left to the right. Oh, it's wonderful. There's so much power and dynamics within that song, within Binge, that frankly, like, that's, that's probably in the top three to top five off the entire album. It's a song that deals openly with, uh, our band's long road with substance abuse and love of chemicals that has been fairly well documented that we're not all, not all super proud of. <laughs> um, but uh, being able to be open about vulnerable things like drug addiction and not being able to break the cycle was something that was really important. That one is, is just kind of uh, discomfort on the record. It's going to make you... Make you kind of feel icky, but love it a little bit. You're good, won't you back that ass up? You're the big fine woman, won't you back that ass up? <laughs> One thing that I think is very pivotal about that song is the fact that lyrically it doesn't have a happy ending. Um, there is this glimmer of hope that the song gives you that our protagonist is going to break away from their ways. And unfortunately, the way life works, not everybody gets a happy ending and I felt like that was very pivotal to put out there and not sew it up with some Hollywood ending of redemption and have it end where, unfortunately, all too many times it ends in real life. It's gonna take a lot to take me away from you.
Suspicious ghosts in the machine Haunting hallways where our bodies used to be Reliving decades of decay A lifetime we had thrown away Reaching back to what's what Drag the waters and you will find The truth I've tried so hard to hide And I'm a villain wrapped in a cheap disguise I'm lost inside this labyrinth of lies Drag the waters is a really fun, fun, energetic piece of music. Probably one of the biggest surprises that came out of the writing process. Um, that song had completely changed. I know when we first started exploring ideas for the, uh, the initial kind of pass at writing the tune, it just didn't have that same kind of transitional magic that we were looking for. Yeah, we're probably like seven different like restructurings in on that song. last batch of songs we we did for the record and uh, yeah it, it, it had a vibe when it came in it was like oh this is cool we got it at the time we had a deadline uh, the shit had not hit the fan yet so we were crunching trying to get songs ready everything dialed in pre-production done had this extra time due to the pandemic. Our studio dates got pushed and we were like, well, let's take this song that's very straight up and standard and let's see if we can shift it and mold it and turn it into something great rather than just another good song. It took a lot of me and Wyatt bouncing things off of each other to really kind of hammer out the guitar parts because the bass and the drums, they, they nailed it from the get-go. Everybody brought their own flavor to it. Rob beats the shit out of his drums, especially that intro and those locked in snare hits that consistently happen throughout the song. Uh, always keep me uh, so into it. Bobby B slaying the skins. The fact that the hook of the song is just the five hit snare walls is something that uh, I feel like I don't hear enough where the hook of your song is a drum riff. It has an entire feel different. It's like swapping out the blood. Yeah. Th that was yeah. super fucking cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. But that with some effects or some backwardsy shit, or I can that have That reminded it. me of a little fish, man. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I like it a lot. That song is very similar to Silver Bullet and really kind of sits in this realm of acknowledging the mistakes that you've made and trying to seek your own road to redemption. Uh, and I feel like that's a profound message that interlaces throughout this record is taking accountability for the shitty things you've done as a human being and being able to forgive yourself enough that you can find your way back to the light after you've been in the dark for so long. You will find the truth I've tried so hard to hide and I'm a villain wrapped in cheap disguise I'm lost inside this labyrinth of life
yeah, lo and behold, we wound up having this really, you know, ridiculously amazing piece of music come out of the process, and I'd say probably one of my favorite moments uh, writing material with uh, my brothers. record uh had COVID-19 not postponed the studio sessions um that song wouldn't have been written and it's a lot of fun to play it's very much like lights out and why I put it in a, in a cool way is basically saying that 
had we been like had we been in a slightly different headspace back when we wrote Lights Out, this would be Lights Out. And frankly, this is what Lights Out should have been. The story of Magna Carta all revolved around this conversation I had had. I had been in line uh, at a at a fast food joint, and a man in line sneezed, and I watched a pack of people in masks all jump in and start swinging on him. And watching everybody assault somebody for sneezing really put into perspective how toxic times had become. And I ended up texting Rob, and I said, you know, it's funny, the virus isn't what scares me. Um, it's the people that scare me. It, it's so funny to feel numb that, you know, the edge of the knife doesn't scare me anymore. Why it presented the idea post COVID-19 pandemic. And like, let's be honest, this is probably the only time we're actually gonna have to deal with a pandemic in our lives. So knock on wood. Um, and why I wanted to give this message of hope. And I thought that was a great idea because everybody's depressed, everybody's lost their jobs, everybody's at home, stuck, quarantined, can't go anywhere. Society right now is in a darker place than it's I ever thought I'd see in my lifetime. And I felt like this was that message of hope and unity that we needed. Everything's doom and gloom right now. Well, right now being uh, it's July 31st. Um, it's still doom and gloom. It's been doom and gloom for five months. And there's no choice. There's no better choice than to write a song of hope when literally everything is hopeless and nobody has hope right now. I used to hold. Sorry, my bad. Dying for. <laughs> Hit him right in the puberty. <laughs>
<laughs> this is going to be great shit for right at the end of the song. Now it's time to break the silence. Stand atop the world alone. And no most revolt with violence. I will show you flesh and bone. I used to hold this promise. I used to have a <laughs> Swan Song was the first song that was written for this record. The we're not gonna give up, this can't be my final last dance. One, two, three. to me is this moment of of self-repair we all have vices we all have issues we all have stuff that we you know hang upon to to help us get through life and life is not a very easy thing let's be honest I know for me uh, both Swan Song and Drag the Waters at home with their themes of uh, you know suicide and deep introspection Especially having lost uh, loved ones close to me through some unfortunate choices. But I think the most important part, though, was that this is something we're all going through together. You know, whether we're as a band, we're also as a family. Swan Song was written about a month and a half after our second record came out. And uh, my wife and I had lost a pregnancy. It was the night before a show. And... It was the single most painful experience I had felt at that time. And I remember calling Kyle, uh, and it was two in the morning, and I had left him a message, and I had said, one of two things is gonna happen. You're never gonna see me again, or we're gonna play the greatest show of our fucking lives tomorrow. And luckily, the, the latter was the case. Um, but through that night, I stayed up and I wrote this song that was the message I needed to hear at that time. I, I needed to hear this voice telling me to persevere and keep climbing up that mountain and not look back. Because uh, when the weight of the world comes crashing down on you, it's really hard to keep your foot. Um, so that song, to me, is the most uh, personal thing I think I've ever written lyrically. The Swan Song itself is hands down musically our most advanced piece and complex piece. A Swan Song is, gotta say, probably the most musically intensive piece that we've worked on as a whole. I would also just like to say I think that that's the best wreckage song to date. Uh, if I had to pick one song from our entire catalog that I believe in most and I think is the truest form of honesty. It's just the perfect send off to the record because you got this this record that four guys came in um, thinking it was going to go one way, having to roll with the punches and really dig for motivation and inspiration in sullen times and uh, highs and lows of, of what has become 2020. And I think it's appropriate because 
it's like at the end of the day, at the end of the record, at the end of the project, when all is said and done, you know, uh, we don't want this to be the last of it, so this can't be our swan song. I also think that it closing the record adds this light at the end of the tunnel, because this entire record is this passage through darkness, and I feel like swan song is that final breath as you crest the top of the mountain. Hey, we all got this, this thing, and we all gotta face it, and some of us uh, seem to do it easily, some of us pretend to do it easily, and some of us struggle really hard openly, and um, I guess it's just important to listen, man. Back in December 2017, Wyatt decided to present a demo for a new song to us, and he said, this is, the, this is it, this is going to be our magnum opus, it's my, my freaking crown jewel, it's called Swan Song, and this has to be it. Give me the strength to carry on When my resolve is dead and gone We're in the eye of the storm Now these locusts will swarm This cannot be my swan song I remember the very first couple times I was trying my best to hang on to some of these uh, ideas he was pitching. Fast forward to like 2019, he brings it back. He goes, well, what if I do this? And boom, drops it down to drop D. And plays it a step lower. And where all of our eyes light up, like, oh my god. Yeah. Maybe you're actually onto something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. From the moment I presented Swan Song to the group, I made the statement, this is going to be the final song on our next record. And everybody kind of laughed it off. And now fast forward, it's the last track on the record. Introducing our new drummer, Kyle Giveney. <laughs> you know, if you were there in the rehearsal space with us, you would have just seen this look of complete puzzlement on my face of, you know, why it being really helpful with the cues of like, Okay, double time here, now regular. Wait, double time, regular. And half time, double time again. And to me, that was funny because my first impressions of it were like a fucking 80s workout video or something. But as time step, grew... Step, <laughs> step, But over time, though, that uh, song has definitely held a special place in my heart, just watching it evolve and... Now it's know, got those buns of steel. Buns of steel. Yeah. Yes, bitch! Yes, yes bitch! Yes, Queen. And we knew that since Swan Song was going to be the big final one from this record, we ended up shooting this really profound video that I'm really proud of um, that deals with suicide and struggles that really inspired the song. And it was really cathartic and really healing to do it. Um, and we were able to really bring this concept full circle. One thing that stood out about the uh, Swan Song video to all of us is, is it, uh, I mean, kind of, it's a heavy subject. And it's not one that people like to openly talk about. It's not one that everybody's ready to share their experiences with uh, this subject matter. You know, the subject matter of, of course, being suicide. <laughs> We're making music. Yeah, we are. We're and poor decision. Music. Poor decisions. Yeah. Um, Mixed with music. We're basically earning a pornographic epitaph. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. So, With this kind of end of this record, we could sew up the story of these characters from these different videos that we had put out. So we kind of created this cinematic universe in a way. Behind the scenes? Uh-huh. It's behind the scenes. Hey! It's behind the scenes! It's behind the scenes? Who invited that guy? Yeah, what the fuck? Who invited behind the scenes? Uh, is there a in front of the scenes? That's me. Oh, that's I'm you. in front of the scenes. Oh, okay. Well, we know now. Uh, that was good. Kind of a unique way uh, 
to tie everything together, you know, what happened to Malcolm's character after the Trauma Queen video. I put on my eyes, my bedroom eyes, if you will, um, and uh, well, we're about to fuck. So this is it, my first scene. I'm nervous. <laughs> what happened to Lindsay's assassin character from War Within afterwards. Um, and we were able to revisit these concepts. I don't know if it, it was obvious to everybody. I know that people that uh, truly pay attention uh, spotted all the Easter eggs. Can you explain? He hit me in the fucking leg with a TV! <laughs> yeah, I went ahead. <laughs> My leg. It definitely came right down on Healy's leg. Are you okay? Uh, it turns out that the TV in his leg had some beef. I, uh, which is my funny. Leg was the beef. It's funny because he's a vegetarian, so like, it's fucking weird that they had beef, but they had he beef. And I stepped in and I was like, "Fuck you, TV!" Ha! It, even the little things we were able to tie in because a couple of the videos on this record are more performance videos. So being able to put. Magna Carta and the television static in Malcolm's scene and being able to uh, have Malcolm smash the television with the guitar that I play in the Drag the Waters video. Um, really were these little Easter eggs that were really fun to tie together this whole journey that we had taken for two plus years. <laughs> Bro, this weed is amazing! Man, it's so good! Oh. God damn man, I gotta tell you. Eating pussy is tough work. <laughs> Give me the strength to carry on When my resolve is dead and gone We're in the eye of the storm Now these vultures will swarm This cannot be my swan song We just officially yeah. finished tracking our record. Yeah, we're done. We are finished. Silver Bullet is in the bag, uh, or in the chamber, in the in the magazine, in the wiener, in the mag. Silver Bullet is in the mag. There you go. In the butt. I think the best part about this record is that I got to make it with my three best friends. I think every every aspect of this record is perfect because you know it's not like we're just coworkers. Like we really are a family. Well, we've endured a pandemic. We endured shit storms of our own creation. We've endured um, member changes. Member changes, exactly. I was about to say that. Um, we've endured a lot. We had to grow yeah. up a lot. Yeah, and, and we had to not only had to grow up a lot and mature a lot as people and band members and and as a team, also as musicians. It's something really cool that I've been a part of, you know, because I came in at the beginning of the writing process for this record and got to partake in. Uh, creating what it became, you know, and uh, of course I got some studs around me so that makes it easy and we're all uh, on the same team in the sense that we want each tune to be the best it can be. And every aspect of this was so communal and everybody's heart was on their sleeve the entire time. Making records is one of the more difficult things because it's like being tossed into a relationship and a marriage that everybody has to come together suddenly on and then you make the record and you disappear and you just had this intense relationship where where your emotions are super high and everybody's freaking out and everybody's worried about the performance uh see it's just like sex and then it all goes away, but you hope you made something really great. Each one of these tracks had so much meaning to each of us on you know on a band level individually and also seeing you know how people respond and kind of attach their own meaning and stories to it as well. That's correct, Rob. And with the new Time Live Music Collection, the softest of rock, you can get all the air supply you want. Working with these guys on three records has only gotten better each time where we are now actually comfortable with each other. We know how each other works. 
I can be very honest about things and we can have a discussion about changing things without it turning into a giant blow up. Um, because there's now, there's a respect across the board between myself and the band, the band and myself, each member of the band individually with me, we can, we can just sit down and have a, a go at it. And we know that it's only in service of the record and trying to make it great. Uh, cause that's the goal. The goal is make an awesome record that the band loves, I love, and that hopefully everybody else will love. The only thing that I hope somebody can grab from this album is a touch of hope. Something that gives them a little bit of joy. Any, anything that takes their mind out of the negative gutter that everything is in. And just give them authentic, real joy or enjoyment or a smile or a wow. Or even a fuck, that was horrible. Anything. Maybe not the last part, but you know what I mean. There are a lot of people who have told us we shouldn't put this record out right now because it won't sell enough or, you know, the world is too distracted with other things. And that's fine by us. I think we want to give people a message of hope in absolutely hopeless times. I'm super grateful for the guys in the band who continued to persevere and even in the midst of the unknown I think that in retrospect, I'm able to listen to this record and kind of see where we've been and where we're going. And I'm thankful for every step of the way. And I'm so fucking excited for what comes next because there's no more unstoppable feeling I have than I'm when I'm on stage with these three. We wanted to drop the record our way. And we found a creative way to... Uh, I don't know, have some fun while we do what we had to do, you know? What we wanted was to say something real and genuine. And if nobody in the world loved this record, I'd be just fine with it. Because I'm so deeply satisfied that I got to speak my truth, and that we all got to speak our truth, and we literally used this album as therapy. We were all able to heal through this process, and I think we're all greater men for it. Do I ever stop fighting? been putting up with my bullshit? No, uh, let's see, there's one, two, three, uh, I think it's probably close to six now. Fuck. Really? Why haven't you quit yet?